This is Joe. I'm back. I'm going to facilitate a, a short period of time here for questions and answers. One of the first questions that came in, was there any special concerns to monitor the liner integrity once they're installed? And I think this, this came in during my talk. Um, the producers say that what they do is look at those each year when they uh, drain down their lagoons, uh, pump their lagoons out, so they're, they're inspecting them manually. I um, want to know if there's any long-term uh, return on investment in these case studies. Um, uh, not any detailed economics, but <clears throat> for the dairies that have chosen them, uh, they obviously feel that that's going to be part of their business plan to, to stay in uh, business in their particular area. I think uh, one thing you had to consider is they are the larger dairies. Another question came in, have uh, we seen any double liner with leak detection systems installed in any egg situations? I have not been able to verify that there have been any in Washington State. So my answer to that is uh, no at present time. Um, and then the question of dealing with manure retrofits for these liners and uh, temporary storage facilities. Basically what they're doing is going in during a time of the year um, when it's uh, conducive for uh, doing field work and so they're able to get their manure out onto their fields or to get it into alternative manure uh, holding ponds while they're um, having a given manure pond worked on. Um, a couple other questions come in. This one would be you, for you, Brian. Um, is there an estimate of the cost to install and operate the res resistivity array? Yeah, I, I meant to cover that. Um, the electronics are the expensive stuff. That actually sets above the ground. The rest of the stuff is uh, just basic wire and conduit and some stainless steel probes. Uh, we think that we can install a system uh, currently for, um, we estimated the ponds at the, at the ARDC site at UNL uh, between 15,000 and upwards to maybe 20,000, depending on the size. Uh, you, can other, you can get uh, other control modules uh, in with the system. Uh, there, you know, it's like, like anything else, you can add different bells and whistles, but we're hoping that uh, as more and more of these begin uh, be, are constructed, the, uh, that electronic price will come down. So in between about $15,000 is what we're thinking. Another question just came in late. Uh, what might be the cost for a seepage test? So that would go to um, <clears throat> our other speakers. So you guys want to make a uh, best guess on what, what it might cost if you wanted to go in and do a seepage test? Sure. It uh, is dependent on geographic location, um, but on, in general, $7,500, which is a fraction of a traditional geotechnical investigation and associated soil uh, laboratory testing program uh, for ver verification of the liner system. Um, it could, okay. If there's ponds, it could be you know twice that. Okay. Um, another question, Brian, are there conditions other than pond leaks that may cause an outlier? Yeah, we yeah yeah we, we talked about that the flooded conditions. That's why we're we're working on the framework to try to figure out how to filter out false positives and uh, and not get too many false negatives. Uh, but that each one of those is going to be site specific, uh, and that's really where we're at right now. But we get, we think we've got a pretty good framework of the criteria to use. And uh, again, it. I, I liken it to a smoke alarm. I mean, many times my smoke alarm's gone off. That just means I forgot that I left something on the stove or the toast is burning. And you go in and check it out, and it's nothing. You move on, and, and uh, we're going to probably have a system operate very similar to that to uh, be on, this, on the safe side. Okay. Um, I think we'll take two more questions here, and then we'll close it up for today. Um, <clears throat> for uh, Burns and Olson, for you guys, do the solids... In the pond, I'm assuming I mean solids in the bottom of the pond, affect the readings made by the probes. Uh, I'll start. Mike can finish. Um, they, they don't. Um, we have, uh, for milk dry cow operations, which has a very thick, viscous manure, and most hogs or swine operations also are very viscous, we accommodate that um, to uh, deal with the fluids to get reliable measurements. Um, it's a little bit different than your standard dairy with a milk parlor which is much more fluid and less viscous. Mike, do you want to add anything to that? Um, the instrument itself uh, is designed to work in um, a, a low viscous fluid or water. And from there, it's a matter of um, uh, 
um, constructing a, a stilling well of water that's in hydraulic communication with the matrix of the waste. Um, so that's uh, that's our vision of how we can do it in in uh, substances that are more uh, more of a solid base. Okay. And last question for today: resistivity system. Uh, will it work well in an eastern humid or wetland environment? Yeah, that that was probably for me. I believe. Uh, yep. The resistivity ray is, is, a, is a tool that has been used by the uh, geologists for almost 100 years. We've just kind of adapted it to meet our specific needs. So it really will function in, in uh, uh, very humid and wet regions. The, the, one of the problems that we run into in very arid regions is the probe design in order to have uh, good contactivity with the soil even under dry conditions. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, probe designs that we're working on that, that are doing very well. We just want to vet them out a little bit more. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody, uh, for being on today. And, again, join us next month. Um, and I'd like to special thanks to the speakers today.